Chapter 18 is restorative information. So restorative activities are activities that are helping people to improve their quality of life, improve their functioning to be able to do their ADLs by themselves. So the rehabilitation, you have to know what this word means. Rehabilitation is the process by which residents improve their functional abilities, such as walking, getting up, moving, dressing, and bathing. So basically improving their ADL. It focuses on restoring and retraining them to be able to take care of themselves. The facility that we went to is a rehabilitation center. So people come there short term after they've had an injury or an illness that has debilitated them some, and they need to restore or retrain in order to get better to be able to take care of themselves at home. Sometimes they're going to use um, different equipment or adaptive equipment that we saw. And it's also, they're going to be able to regain the ability to care for themselves. So you need to be encouraging them to do as much as they can do for themselves. The occupational therapists are the ones that work with small muscle groups. And the physical therapists work with large muscle groups like ambulating and walking them down the halls. So the restorative process has four primary areas. We're going to establish short and long-term goals. We need to find out what the resident needs help with and help them set realistic goals to be able to accomplish these goals to get better to go home. They're going to be a good cheerleader for them. You're going to help them strive for their own independence. So you're going to cue them and prompt them and encourage them. But if the physical therapist or occupational therapist is using a certain medical terminology, you are going to reinforce that medical terminology. Like if they're telling them to do range of motion, you need to say, do your range of motion. Or if they're telling them to work with flexion of their knee, make sure you're using that same medical terminology and reinforcing it, the ones that the occupational or physical therapists are using. Any other time you're not using medical terminology because you don't want to confuse them, but if it's something that the therapists are working with them on and telling them and encouraging them, then you need to use that same terminology. Like keep your knee flexed if it's an amputee because we want to have them keep their knee straightened out. Okay. Identifying assistive devices. Everybody saw that um, weighted spoon, like the built-up handled spoon that the one lady had. It had like a foam handle on it so she could grip it herself and feed herself. And then one of the residents had a divided plate where he had a certain plate where he'd be able to feed himself because he's had a stroke. So he needs that adaptive equipment. But it's any kind of equipment that helps them to walk, to transfer independently. So some of them have those wooden sliding boards where they put a board between the bed and the wheelchair and they just slide down the board to get into the wheelchair. Not everybody's going to be able to get up, stand up, and transfer into their wheelchair, but their goal is to get into the wheelchair independently, so they're using that sliding board as an adaptive equipment. Um, walkers are also adaptive equipment. So a lot of people there had walkers, and you saw everybody had their own walker in so we'll be working with the walkers. The walkers for the hand grips, they need to be at hip or waist level, and they always need to be within reach of the residents so they can get up and get out of the bed and use them themselves. Uh, like we talked about, they are not supposed to be pulling themselves out of the bed with their walker. They need to stand up first and then place their hands on their walker. And when they're pushing their walker, they don't tilt the walker. They just slide it across the floor six to eight inches and then walk into the walker. Uh, but when they step into the walker, they only step into where their hand grips are. So their hands are never behind their hips when they're walking, just for stability. Um, crutches, we're not going to see too much in long-term care. But if you're in a hospital setting, somebody on orthopedic floor may need crutches right after they've had some kind of cast or something on their leg. But uh, crutches are really hard to balance on. A lot of flexibility is required with the crutches, but you're going to move the crutches and then hop into it with your good leg. There's different kinds of canes that people are using. A quad cane, we have an example in the clinical room, only it has four tips on it. That's what a quad cane means. The J canes are just a straight cane, just a typical cane, like you can buy at the um, Walgreens or anywhere, just with the one tip on it. And the cane is used to support the weak leg, so it should be held on the hand opposite the weak leg. 
So you need to hold it on the strong side. So they hold it on the strong side and it helps them with balance. It does not help them with weight bearing. It only helps with balance. A patient who has had congestive heart failure or a stroke may need help with balance and then they would use a cane on their strong side. Your prosthetic or orthotic devices are, are specific equipment that's used for the person that helps um, a missing or non-functioning or not fully functioning body part. So everybody saw the hearing aids that were there. Everybody saw the glasses. Those are specific to that person. You can't share them with someone else, but that's what makes it a prosthetic. It's helping them with their eyes. It's helping them with their ears. There's also people with prosthetic legs. The lady who had just got her spitted for her prosthetic leg. So it's specific to the person to help them with a, a missing or non-functioning body part. Your orthotic devices are things more for your feet to keep your feet in good alignment, things like that. So always encourage them to use their glasses. We already talked about this some. Um, write the description of their glasses on the inventory list. When they come in as a new admission, you write how many pairs of glasses they came in with and you write what color the glasses are or are they red plastic frames or are they gray wire frames? And then, because most of the glasses don't have their names written on them, but that way we can keep up with whose glasses belong to who. And when you're cleaning the glasses, it's supposed to be just with a wet, warm, soft cloth to help prevent scratches. And then don't place the glasses face down on the table so you don't scratch them up. When they're not in use, they need to go in a case with the person's name labeled on it and in the top drawer. So everybody's personal belongings were in the top drawer of their bedside dresser. Um, make sure that the glasses aren't causing any skin breakdown. If you notice any skin breakdown on their nose or on the tops of their ears, let us know so we can put some padding on their glasses and then store them in a case when not in use. The hearing aids. So turn them off when they're not in use. Assist them with changing the batteries when needed. The nurses have the batteries in the med cart. And when we were at clinical the other day, there was a person there that had, she had, they just charged. They were rechargeable ones. So she stuck the hearing aids into that little case and it was charging it up like you do your phone. So I had never seen that before, but that was pretty neat. So they don't have to change the little battery. But the little batteries are really tiny, but we need to help them change the batteries. And then never submerge them in water. How you clean your hearing aid is with an alcohol wipe. So when you are putting the hearing aid in, you pull up an in-the-ear hearing aid, which means it's going to slide inside their ear. You have to pull up on their ear, ear um, the outside of their ear, and shove it in the ear. Okay? To get it out, you pull down on the earlobe, and then it helps it come out. And then we're just going to clean them off with alcohol. All right, your orthotic devices. These are the ones that are specially made, usually for the the legs or the arms that help with splinting and bracing things. But if you see the word AFO, it's ankle foot orthosis. That's to help with foot drop or to help with plantar fasciitis. Some people put these or wear these when they're in the bed to keep their foot in the um, plantar flexion so that, or dorsiflexion so that they don't get foot drop. If you have to slide someone's foot into a brace or this big, huge blue AFO thing, you need to put it inside the shoe first and then slide their foot into it. If you put the brace on their foot, you're never going to get the shoe on top of the brace. So put the brace in the shoe and then slide their foot into the brace in the shoe. So this is just a picture of what those giant AFOs look like. Um, make sure that any of these Velcro things are fitting properly, like we put that leg extender on the amputee. We split it on him, it has Velcro everywhere, it needs to fit properly. The residents know how to put them on, you just need to ask them. If they can't put it on themselves, then you're going to help them, but you're going to encourage them to get it on as best they can themselves, because when they go home, they're going to have to put it on themselves. And then if there's a cast in place, make sure that the distal part is warm and has normal color. 
So the distal part is the part furthest away from the body. So if somebody has a cast on their arm, you're going to make sure that their fingers are still getting good circulation. They're warm, they're pink, they're normal feeling. So if you see the word pink on anything, pink is normal. If you have pink nails, that's normal. If you have red nails, that's abnormal. If you have blue nails, that's abnormal. But pink nails mean that you have good circulation and everything is fine. Pink mucous membrane, like pink lips or pink, um, pink nose, things like that is, norm, is a normal finding. Your positioning and seating devices, these are used to support the residents when they need extra support in their wheelchairs. There were a few residents there that had cushions that they were sitting on to help prevent pressure ulcers, um, but they're also good for support. And you're going to make sure that you're using anything that's ordered for them as far as a cushion or supportive device or even a roll or a heel or elbow protector. There are some that just go on the ends at the bottom of their feet for heel protectors to keep their heels off of the bed, to float their heels. Floating their heels means putting a pillow under their ankles so that the heels aren't touching the bed, so they're not getting pressure on the heels. Your ADLs, your aids for the activities of daily living, there were a bunch of different restorative aids there that we saw at clinical. Um, some people need a dressing stick. Some people need a long-handled shoehorn to help get their shoes on. Long-handled sponges to bathe themselves in the shower, which I will work on that when we go back this week. Um, but they have reachers, so we saw that gopher grabber reacher thing that kind of folds out. If they can't reach something on the top shelf, then they'll just reach it with the reacher to get to it. A sock donner is to help get their socks on because they can't bend down far enough to reach their feet. Raised toilet seats. So some of those bedside commodes were on top of the toilet so that they didn't have to bend so far, so far down to get to the toilet. So it's a raised seat right above the toilet. And then of course there were grab bars everywhere in the shower rooms, in the bathrooms, things for them to grab onto where they can pull themselves up with. Um, built on grips on the utensils like we talked about the lady with the spongy handle utensils. Um, there are some places that have restorative aids that are CNAs that help with restorative activities. So the CNAs do the range of motion, they do the exercises, um, and the mornings, every time when Yolanda is doing the exercises. She's a CNA, but she gets them in the group in that big activity room, and they do activities together, but they do active range of motion. So they sit in a circle, and she leads them and tells them, okay, we're going to raise our hands up over our head ten times. Now we're going to run like a bicycle. 10 times. So that's active range of motion where the residents are actually participating in it by themselves, but they're moving all of their body parts. But all of the range of motion, splinting, bed mobility, even eating and swallowing is all charted on the restorative flow sheet. Um, we want to make sure that they're reaching their goals and that they're actually participating in activities that are going to help them to reach their goal. But then you need to chart um, how they're doing with the activities, like if they're able to do it independently or if they're still needing assistance or how much assistance they need for each activity. Improper use of equipment can cause accidents, so we need to make sure that we're using equipment properly. If you don't know how to use the equipment, you need to ask the nurse. Um, and if the nurse doesn't know, then we'll ask the therapist. But somebody knows how to properly use the equipment we need to make sure that the residents are in a safe position to use the equipment. And then if any of the equipment is damaged, we need to report it to the supervisor or to the occupational therapist or physical therapist so that they can have it fixed. Um, your strengthening exercises are your active range of motion, where the resident can do it independently. The assisted active range of motion, where the body part is weak and you may just need to help them a little bit or cue them and, and push it just a tad bit but not bear too much weight. And passive range of motion is when you are actually bearing all of their weight or the majority of their weight and moving the, the um, joint for them. So we've already worked on a little bit the range of motions, but this is the video on just 
full range of motion from head to toe for a dependent resident, someone who can't move themselves or can't reposition themselves, you are going to have to do passive range of motion. So P-R-O-M, you will do that on the dependent resident. In many facilities, the neck is not exercised without a physician's order. Know and follow your facility's policy. If your facility allows range of motion exercises on the neck, begin by assisting the resident to a sitting position. Tip the head forward, bringing the chin to the chest. Tip the head backward with the chin up. Now move the head from side to side. Then move the head back and forth in a circular motion. Now we will move to the shoulders, arms, and elbows. Assist the resident into the supine position. Begin by raising the arm over the head, then return the arm to the side. Move the arm away from the side, as far away from the body as possible, then return to the side. Move the arm across the chest until the fingers touch the opposite shoulder. Return the arm to the side. With the arm straight out at the side, bend at the elbow and rotate the shoulder. Return the arm to the side. Bend at the elbow and bring the hand to the chin or shoulder. Return the arm to the side. Repeat these procedures with the other arm. Next, we move to the wrists, fingers, and forearms. Support the elbow. Grasp the hand as in a handshake. Turn the palm up, then down. Bend the hand backward at the wrist, then return to the neutral position. Move the hand from side to side, first toward the thumb, then outward. Move the hand in a circle. Clench the fingers and thumb as if making a fist. Extend the fingers and thumb. Move fingers and thumb together and then apart. Flex and extend joints in the thumb and fingers. Move the thumb in a circular motion. Repeat with the other hand. The next areas are the legs, hips, and knees. Keeping the knee straight, raise the leg up and down. Bend and straighten the knee. With the leg resting on the bed, roll it inward and outward. Stretch the leg out from the body. Return the leg to touch the other leg. With the leg straight on the bed, Push foot and toes toward the knee, then back down. Repeat with the other leg. The ankles, feet, and toes are the last areas to cover. Push the foot and toes out straight, pointing toward the foot of the bed. With the leg straight, turn the foot and ankle from side to side. Bend the toes downward and upward. Spread each toe apart, then back together. Repeat with the other foot. As with any procedure, finish by performing your procedure completion actions. Always remember to check the care plan for limitations and guidelines for each resident. Make sure you provide enough space for full movement of the extremities and help the resident to relax during the exercise. Perform each joint motion three to five times. Never push the resident past the point of joint resistance. And if the resident complains of pain, stop the exercise and report to the nurse. Okay, so the biggest thing there is to make sure you're not pushing it too far 
because some people are contracted and they can't extend it out all of the way or they can't um, flex it too much. And then also you're going to ask them if they're in pain and before you start the activities and then during the activity and you're going to watch for grimacing or you're going to watch for silent communication that they are in pain and then you're going to stop and report it to the nurse if they complain of pain or you think that they may be in pain while they're doing their exercises. But it's important to make sure everybody is getting exercises because it helps prevent contractures or it helps prevent contractures from getting worse. All right, your guidelines for your range of motion, know what type of exercise is needed so you have to watch your care plan, um, remove any obstacles that are in your way, explain to the residents what you're going to do and why, and then help them into the correct position for each activity. Remember your own body mechanics, get as close as you can to the person so you're not straining your back or stretching your arms out to reach to them. Keep both hands on the extremity. The hand above the joint is going to stabilize the joint. The hand below the joint is the one that's actually moving the joint. And then be gentle and never force your joint past the point of constricture, contracture. Um, there could be pain and swelling, you could rupture their tendon, you could pull their muscle, you could tear their skin, so there's a lot of injury that you can do if you're forcing their joints to move. During the exercise, you're frequently looking for your facial expressions, you're asking the resident if they're in pain, and you're going to stop if they say that they're in pain, and you're doing your exercises at least once a day or as ordered by the therapist. So it only takes about 15 minutes to do the whole range of motion exercise. So if you have a bedridden dependent person, you need to do range of motion exercises. Okay. This next video is going to be doing shoulder and knee and ankle. Those are the ones you're going to have to do for national testing. We're going to go and practice and do all of them, but the ones specific for national testing are just either your shoulder or your knee and ankle. Thank you. Have a nice day. Come in. Hello, Mr. Mayor. My name is Sonia. I'm going to be your CNA today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. 
Jersey. And raise your bed so comfortable working here. Keep your knees. I'll pretend to hear that your head of your bed is flat. and extend your shoulder. I'm going to put one hand to stabilize the shoulder, above the shoulder or on the shoulder, to help move the shoulder. If you experience any pain, you're going to let me know and we will stop. Okay? We're going to flex your shoulder to your ear level, then back down extending it to your bed. Adjusting it back towards your body at least three times. And if you experience any pain, you let me know. We're only going to the point where we feel resistance is stopping. Thank you. I'm going to wash my hands, lower your bed back to the low position, and open the pressure. All right, so we're going to practice on all these range of motions again. Um, just make sure you know this terminology. So highlight these things in your book. Flexion means bending the joint towards the body. When you tell somebody to flex their muscles, they pull their arm in and they flex so that they're pulling it towards the body. Extension means straightening it away from the body. So think of an extension cord makes it longer. When you're stretching out a joint, it stretches it out away from the body. Abduction means moving it away from the body. If somebody's kid got abducted, they got taken away. Adduction means adding it back towards the body. And then pronation means that your palm is facing down. Supination means your palm is facing upwards. So whenever you're grabbing something, your palm is always facing upward. When you're grabbing the gate belt, when you're holding onto their limbs, your palms are always up in supine or supination position. Walking your resident is called ambulation. We've talked about this already. Make sure you're checking the care plan, checking for the order. If they are on CBR, that means complete bed rest. That means they're not allowed to get up. Okay. Maybe they haven't had their surgery yet. Maybe they still have a broken bone or a fracture. But if they are on CBR, it's complete bed rest. It's time that they're supposed to be healing, but they're not allowed to get up and ambulate and walk around. Up ad lib means they can get up on their own whenever they feel like it. And then make sure if they need a walker or cane that you're keeping those walkers and canes close by to them where they can reach them and get up and use them when they need to. Your walker is used if the resident can support some weight and the cane is used when the resident can support their own weight but they need a little bit of help with their balance. And then again, the crutches are rarely used because they're hard to do. But if you are using crutches, the weight is on the hand grips. So we're going to practice that and just make sure that when you put your weight on the crutches, you're holding on to the hand grips, but the weight is not up underneath their armpits. So they shouldn't be leaning on the crutches with their armpits. The same reason we shouldn't be pulling them up by their arms. It can dislocate their shoulder or can injure some veins or arteries under their armpits. So the weight is not on their armpit. The weight is actually on their hand grips. And their elbows are slightly bent when the crutches are in the right position. But the crutches have an adjustment on them just like the walkers do where you put it in the right position for that person and it's adjusted that one time and it should be at the right level. Um, allow them to dangle on the side of the bed before getting up. Observe them for dizziness or fatigue or sweating. If they say they're dizzy, tell them to sit back down. We already did helping the falling residents. So if you're ambulating somebody and they tell you, oh, my legs are fixing to give out, you're going to help them to the floor. 
helping the falling resident down or you're going to be walking behind them with a wheelchair so that they can just sit down in the wheelchair. Residents may ask you why they have to walk. We're going to tell them that it helps them get stronger. It's going to help them get better so they can go home and just generally encourage them to walk. It helps them feel better. Respect their right to refuse. So if they say they don't want to walk right now, you're going to ask them for a different time that they would like to walk. And then come back when they want to walk or come back. Don't just say, well, you have to walk now because it's ordered. We still have to respect their rights, but we still need to be encouraging them to try to walk. Uh, if they need their oxygen, you're going to push it around with that little metal um, wheeled oxygen tank holder and then make sure that they have the nasal cannula in and you're not running over their oxygen tubing. Some of the oxygen tubing is long enough for them to reach to the bathroom. So if it's still hooked to their oxygen concentrator, they can still get to the bathroom. Some of them you're gonna have to take it off the oxygen concentrator, put it on a portable tank, and then take them to the bathroom. But they need to wear their oxygen when they're getting up, even if they're just going to the bathroom. Um, otherwise, they're gonna get short of breath and they're gonna get hypoxic. Their oxygen saturation is gonna fall below 90 and then they're gonna pass out in the bathroom. Some more ambulation guidelines, the resident has a weak side. If they have a weak side because they've had a stroke or some cognitive impairment or muscle impairment, you need to walk slightly behind them on their weak side. And again, their cane is used on their strong side. So when they're using a cane, holding it on their strong side, they move the cane and the weak side forward first. <laughs> Now we will discuss ambulating a resident using a walker. Perform your beginning procedure actions. Ensure that the walker is properly adjusted with the top of the walker even with the resident's hip joint. Check the rubber tips to ensure they are safe with no holes or cracks. Place the walker close to the resident. Place the gate belt on the resident and assist him or her to a standing position. Hold the gate belt firmly at the back and stand at the resident's weaker side. Assist the resident to grasp the hand grips and move inside the walker. Instruct the resident to lift and move the walker about six inches ahead of his or her body. Lean on the walker for support and walk forward into the walker. Ambulate the resident by walking slightly behind and to one side. Support the resident as needed using the gate belt. Perform your beginning procedure actions. Check that the cane is the proper height with the top of the cane even with the resident's hip joint. Check the condition of the rubber tips. Replace them if the tips have holes or cracks. Place the gate belt on resident and assist him or her to a standing position. Instruct the resident to hold the cane on the stronger side of his or her body. Instruct the resident to place the cane about eight inches to the side of his or her foot. Instruct the resident to shift weights to his or her stronger leg. Resident should move the cane about 12 inches ahead of body as the weaker leg moves forward. Now have resident move his or her stronger leg slightly beyond the cane. Ambulate the resident by walking slightly behind and to one side. Support him or her as needed using the gate belt. Perform procedure completion actions. <laughs> Assist the resident to walk the required time and distance. Allow and encourage the resident to rest as needed. Encourage the resident to hold the handrails unless a walker is used. Encourage the resident to stand erect with back straight and head up. Teach the resident to walk normally with the heel of foot touching the floor first. Assist the resident into chair or bed after ambulation. Perform your procedure completion actions. 
Okay, so just remember when they're using a cane, the cane and the weak leg go forward first and then the strong leg. Any questions?